the way that we see the Caribbean Sea here in the Caribbean Environmental Program is uh, like the main pillar for the social and economic development in the wider Caribbean region. We also consider that the Caribbean Sea is uh, our home for unique biodiversity. And we gave that a uh, tremendous importance because we know the amount of people that come to the region for recreation, but at the same time, it's also the source for food, transportation. And when we talk about transportation, we talk about people, we talk about oil, we talk about goods and services. And in general, we see this as the lifeblood for the Caribbean people. Earth Mother. Born from Earth we are, and into Earth we return. She sustains us. She feeds us an abundance. Out of her depths, a feast. Laid out, a bountiful harvest. Diversity from the deep. The issue of water quality is important because it determines whether we can use our water or not. If the water is dirty or polluted, then that means it's not usable. Therefore, the water quality is poor. If the water is nice and clean and healthy, then we can use our water. 80% of the pollutant laws in the Caribbean Sea are originated from land-based source of pollution. That is why in the 90s, governments asked us to develop a protocol on land-based source of pollution. And it took us five years of negotiation to reach the consensus to have a protocol on land-based source of pollution in the wider Caribbean region. Now, just how does the LBS protocol help? Well, it alerts us to the serious problem of pollution from the land, and it identifies the main pollutants affecting our Caribbean Sea. We did a study that tried to identify what were the major sources of pollution affecting the environment from land-based activities. The number one was untreated sewage, coming from, from everywhere, coming from outfalls and from pipes and so. And the other main one came from from agricultural runoff. So the use of fertilizers and pesticides. When you have heavy rainfall and you don't have proper land use practices, a lot of that ends up as sediment and runoff into the marine environment. We have a lot that we have to deal with. So we have to decide where can we make the greatest impact? Where is there the highest risk, both to human health and the environment? And try and focus our initial efforts on those priority areas. Eighty to ninety percent of wastewater is discharged into the sea without treatment. I would say, as far as thirty-six years ago, the Caribbean Environmental Program and many governments within the region identified that runoff or discharges from non-point sources of pollution were impacting the region significantly, and they recognized that something needed to be done. Wastewater that is discharged from properties eventually finds its way to the coastal waters. Since the wastewater contains harmful organisms, disease-forming organisms, it is a, pot a potential risk to persons using the coastal waters, especially the near shore waters. We have to recognize that wastewater management and its effective treatment is not something that we can ignore. It is, in fact, a significant development requirement, particularly in the context of a region whose development and whose quality of life of its people rest on its natural resource base. So if we fail to treat with the issue of managing wastewater effectively, we are perhaps dooming our region to a future that is not prosperous, both in terms of our economic development, in terms of the health of our people, in terms of the quality of life, and in terms of hedging our bets in terms of how we adapt to climate change. It is absolutely essential that we deal with this. 
The challenge now is that as population growth has, has taken place, we've had a, a mushrooming in terms of our tourism industry, we've had greater development, especially along the coastline, the funding for wastewater has not kept pace with the investment that we now need in the wastewater sector. So you find that the traditional sources of revenue that we normally get from taxes is just not enough. As you go from one country in the Caribbean to another, water and wastewater utilities always seem to be the ones which are most poorly operated, poorly managed, they're not financially viable. So the crew is attempting to do direct support to the utilities to enable them to prepare bankable and financially viable wastewater projects. We had a discussion with the development banks who said there is money out there for wastewater management, but they're not getting good proposals to access these funds. We have stripped her off cover, bent her to the elements, exposed her, laid waste, and left her barren. Sometimes we throw our garbage into the sea because we think the sea will swallow it up and it'll magically disappear. But it doesn't. Today, pollution from the land that reaches the sea is endangering our lives. Fish stocks are being contaminated, our natural reefs are dying, mangroves are disappearing, and the quality of our recreational bathing waters is being affected by land-based sources of pollution. Such pollution has negative impacts on our health, our livelihoods, our jobs whether in tourism or fishing, and on the natural ecosystems, mangroves, seagrass beds, and coral reefs. The waste we throw away on the land, like the waters in our rivers, eventually ends up in the sea where it can have serious effects for fishermen, beachgoers and other users of the sea. We must be very aware of what we do on the land so that it does not affect other users of the marine resources. Pollution uh, takes many forms. For example, you can get physical pollution of the coastal water. In that case, you may have situations where physical items, for example, bottles, glass bottles, or metal objects that are sharp and so on, are present in the coastal environment. And there presents an opportunity for injuries and accidents. The more common means by which uh, such pollution can affect man is through the uh, transmission of diseases. There is a myth in our population that seawater does not carry germs. Nothing is further from the truth because contaminated seawater can carry germs and do carry germs. Corruption spreads, igniting disease and death. We will pay the fatal price for not caring, even for not knowing. Land runoff is the primary source of suspended solids, which can cause murky waters. 10 million tons of sediment per year reaches our Caribbean Sea due to soil erosion from hillsides, plowed fields, construction sites and quarries. The soil is supposed to be on the land rather than in the river. Soil loss is like a double jeopardy because in the river it reduces the quality and quantity of water and also when it gets into the marine ecosystem. It is a problem. So reduction in the quality of water is as a result of deforestation, slash and burn, planting when you don't plant on the contour, plowing or bad tillage when you have also mechanization, soil mechanization. If you put a tractor, you'll have what is called a hard pan. You will also have the tractor creating some lines that can cause further erosion. So all of these contribute to soil erosion. One of the main factors that we have affecting water quality in the coastal environment is sediment. 
Sediment is being washed, uh, washed out from the land and enters the marine environment either directly or indirectly through rivers. When it rains, the, the layman in the street can see the state of the water after a rainy period. It gets very brown. That prevents light from entering and the water and reaching the systems that require light to survive. It also creates like a blanket of dirt on coral reefs and seagrass beds which require light and require oxygen to survive. So it's, it would be like putting a blanket on a human being, a very thick blanket, you would not be able to breathe. So it has a similar effect, it suffocates the systems and the systems die. When people degrade the hillsides and cause soil to be washed into the sea, this has the effect of um, smothering the corals which means the loss of habitat to all the other inhabitants of the reef. So if the corals die, the eventual thing is the reef dies also. In the modern world, there is a lack of environmental awareness and this is how thousands of tons of pesticide residue get into the marine ecosystem. The REPCAR project, implemented together with Banacol, also seeks to establish strategies that monitor the environmental impact of alternative crop management. Inicialmente, nosotros este Eh, no estábamos tan seguros de, de, de la viabilidad del proyecto, sabíamos el costo que tenía. Algunos se han acercado y le dicen a uno, eh, usted está loco, ustedes están locos, lo que están haciendo, eso solo lo hace la gente orgánica, eh, eso es un costo muy alto. Eh, Banacol inclu, incluso ha, ha adoptado esta, esta práctica en, 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 en otras fincas. Los beneficios del proyecto son reducción de plaguicidas, un mejor control de erosión del suelo y este, plantaciones más sanas. Our goal is to protect the environment for future generations. And that is why we carry out specific and sustainable actions. We maintain conservation areas and respect the areas surrounding water sources in order to prevent contamination. Samples are taken periodically from springs in order to verify that our agricultural practices are being properly implemented. We are innovators in the use of new agrochemicals that do not damage the environment and are also effective in controlling pests or diseases in crops. We use organic products to control diseases and decomposing bacteria to accelerate the rate at which organic material is incorporated into the soil. With the Repcar project and Banacol cultivating well-being, the communities have seen benefits and their livelihoods have improved dramatically. I will introduce you to Mrs. Silvia Rosa Ramos. She is the head of her family and her role means that she is conscious of her responsibility to the environment. Mrs. Ramos, tell us about your farm before it was part of the Repcar project and how do you now contribute to the caring of the environment? Sí, eh, señorita. Before I started the program, the farm had severe weeds. Before the project, I was spending 15,000 centimetres of herbicides, but now I've reduced that to 900 centimetres. With the good practices, I have learned to manually control the harmful weeds. Because of this, I am helping the environment. Mrs. Ramos's farm is an example of how to put into practice good agricultural methods. For the Red Car project, it is also important to tend to the training and technically assist farmers. We degrade and contaminate, playing games with nature, gambling with our well-being, our livelihood. Are the beaches more or less polluted? Those are fundamental questions that would help measure how effective the protocol is. So we, we really now need to, to do an assessment of where are we in terms of pollution, in terms of our portable water, in terms of our practices in the watersheds. And then once we establish that sort of baseline, then we monitor and we evaluate. Many believe that development can be achieved at the expense of the natural environment but the converse is true. Development must go hand in hand with protection of the natural environment.
there is a cost, I would dare say there is a greater cost if nothing is done. What we need to do now is to move it beyond us talking among ourselves as technocrats and get, get others involved at different levels. One level, of course, is a policy level because you may need to amend certain policies or legislation and so on and you need some commitment of resources. So we really need to get the, the policy makers involved. In addition, there are a number of stakeholders, and we use that word so loosely, but, but basically there are a lot of people who stand to benefit or to suffer as a result of either doing something or not doing something. What we are trying to do through this program is to, to let people understand you know, what this is all about and, and to recognize that it's not something that is up in the clouds that is only meaningful to to those people in the environment division. It's meaningful to everybody. Industrial and commercial development must be managed properly to sustain the very environment that provides us with so many resources. If we do not act now, we may become a fatality of our own lack of foresight. It's all in education. We cannot continue the way well, this is how we used to do it. So if that's the way we used to do it, you continue doing it like that and nobody wins. We must change that attitude. And it disturbs me. It really does. Especially when I look at the little ones. That's why I'm so much into trying to educate them. The problems are many and varied, but the Caribbean Environment Program is committed to work with differing groups of people throughout the region to make things better. As Caribbean people, we may have our differences, but we have common hopes and needs. Hopes for sustained livelihoods in fishing and agriculture, industry and tourism, needs for a safe and secure food supply, jobs and incomes, desires that there will always be places of beauty and solitude for our relaxation and recreation. The Caribbean Environment Program uses these unifying elements to build commitments at regional, national and community levels that will bring about real change. SEP brings together all Caribbean people by providing expertise, giving access to technology, finding adequate funding and providing hope across the divides of language, culture and geography. One main thing I've learned is that not only the Caribbean, but right now is the entire world that have the same problem. We had the responsibility from the governments to protect the coastal and marine environments in, in the wider Caribbean region, in particular regarding the Caribbean Sea, but also its dynamic and the diverse uh, issues affecting them.